Right, I'm Pete Sherlow, I'm the head of the Institute of Irish Studies and I'm delighted tonight to be here with the London Irish Lawyers Association and even more delighted to be here with uh, Mary Robinson. Uh, one of the things we were just talking about is I know Mary's a no-nonsense person, she could be like myself, she'd be from Belfast, one of, part of our, one of our good cultural traits. And just saying I'm from Belfast, I'm going to be very quick, which will be rare as well. Uh, uh, but one of the things is that, uh, is, is that although uh, uh, people from Ireland don't like praise, I think we have to acknowledge that, that Mary has been a very important part of all of our lives. Uh, part of that praiseworthiness has to be this week, which now has evolved as the week in which everybody in Ireland has the right to marriage equality and every woman has a right to control her body. And it was the agency and the work of Mary and others in the, in, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, which brought about that massive cultural change in our island. So I think that's something that we must celebrate Mary for, uh, and, th and that was just happening. We all play a role in that. Uh, Maeve here, for example, is one of our staff at the, at the Institute of Irish Studies. And if you live in the south of Ireland during the Eighth Amendment, and you didn't open your door and she was standing there, <laughs> you weren't at home. Okay, so, so I think, and this is an important point, I think also about the issue of uh, environmental. We, we, are, we are looking at extinction. This is not scare tactic. This is not fear. And when I was walking through Dublin last week, one of the things I noticed was the headline in the Irish Independent was, the biggest political issue in Ireland is the environment. It's something which, we, which all of us really need to get clued into. And I'm sure Mary will talk about this much better than me. But, but what's really important is the agency that drove the liber social liberalisation of Ireland is the agency we need to save the planet. This is not simply about reusing and, and it's, about, it's about changing our economic system. And most certainly when we change our economic system, how we put uh, women into that uh, equation. And, and one of the things I'm very proud of is our campus in Liverpool not only hosts the Stevenson Institute, it also is 100% renewable. So, so, so it's how major bodies like universities, your businesses and others, how they actually prove and develop renewable technologies. I'm just going to share a very quick anecdote. I was just telling Mary, uh, once I flew to O'Hare, Chicago, and I, I, I bought the trees and I, and I, I made a donation to environmental charities because I was going to fly across the Atlantic. And when I got there, I had to hire a car and I hired, I hired, a, I hired a hybrid car, a very small, very small 100 miles of the gallon type car. And the woman at the Hertz desk had been insulted by the, one of the people who'd been the previous customer. So I said, that's terrible. They shouldn't have spoken to you. It's, not, it's really horrible. You did nothing wrong. You know, you know that, that people shouldn't speak to you like that. It's terrible. And when I went out to get my car, because I'd been nice to her, she'd given me this souped up <laughs> sports car with a convertible roof. So good intentions sometimes don't produce the right uh, responses. But of course, we're delighted to have Mary here. She's been a great friend of the Institute, so much so that when I was doing my PhD, Murray first came as president, and she is still supporting the work that we're doing, and obviously supporting uh, the, the Irish Lawyers Association too. So thank you very much. Welcome to our campus. We have three. We actually have one in Liverpool, uh, we have one in London, and we have one in Shanghai. So you're all very welcome, and I hope you enjoy tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and I'm also going to be brief because that is, uh, is the instruction. But um, on behalf of the London Irish Lawyers Association, we are um, very privileged and, and honoured, in fact, to have Mary Robinson here this evening to address us on the topic of women's leadership and climate change. I did print off the CV. It's extremely, extremely long, but we all know her and remember with great pride um, the period when Mary Robinson was president of Ireland, the first woman president from 1990 to 1997. Then, of course, appointed UN High Commissioner for Human, for human Rights until 2002. And since then, she has really dedicated her professional time to the issue of climate change. Her foundation in Dublin did a great deal of work for over nine years on the issue uh, and she herself is currently the adjunct professor for climate justice in Trinity College and of course chair of the elders. So to many of us in this room, uh, Mary Robinson of course needs no introduction. She is of course uh, an absolute leader of our time but to us uh, she is a role model, she is an inspiration and we're truly delighted to have her here with her this evening to hear her thoughts on leadership, women's leadership in particular and our collective responsibility for climate change. So please give a very warm Lila welcome to Mary Robinson.
Thank you very much, Gronje, and thank you, Pete, also. Uh, it's nice to be back in the context of the University of Liverpool and the Irish Institute, and also to meet with lawyers. Uh, I find it hard these days not to talk about climate change when I'm asked to talk, or I don't even call it climate change anymore. I either call it climate justice or the climate crisis, the climate emergency. But the words climate change don't do it anymore. But I find it very hard not, you know, to, 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 uh, to talk about something else. But I'm aware that many of you may want to raise other things. So when we have the Q&A, I'm happy that we raise any other issue except that six-letter word, Brexit. <laughs> no Brexit, please. <laughs> Otherwise, we can have a, a good conversation more widely afterwards. But why is it that I feel a, an absolute compulsion to speak about climate change, to speak about the climate emergency, to speak about climate justice? Um, I think it's because climate change, the situation of it, is worse than we think, worse than we know, worse than we imagine and it's getting worse more quickly. But the good news is we're learning that we can do a great deal and we can get on track. And therefore, uh, we have a gap of time. And uh, what the children who've marched for the Fridays for Future um, have been telling us is they now know that we are not doing what we should be doing. And they are saying to us, we want you to provide us with a proper future. I was in the uh, General Assembly at the Climate Summit uh, when Greta Thunberg uh, gave that incredible speech in which basically she was angry because she said, you know, I shouldn't be here. Um, you've stolen my childhood. And then she went on to say, you know, but you're just involved in business as usual. And she looked around and she said, how dare you? And I thought it was a really interesting way of challenging um, the representatives of governments. How dare you? How dare you not care enough about my future? I mean, it's a really interesting idea that a 16-year-old has to say to the world's government representatives, you should be thinking about my future and you should be on track to do something about it. So let me kind of give you some insight into the um, experience that I had, which um, I found very interesting, obviously, but also very valuable in trying to understand how we move forward on climate change. Um, and I go back to 19, to, not 19, um, to 2015. Um, that was the year when there were very serious negotiations taking place. And I had a kind of inside track. I was there watching and observing in a very insider way because I was the UN um, Secretary General's Special Representative on Climate Change in 2014 and to the end of 2015, just after the Paris Agreement. And the first agreement negotiated was the 2030 Agenda with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And I wear this badge um, a lot. I wear it almost always, partly because it goes with everything, and I quite like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, as I was observing, uh, it was a messy negotiation over about two years, but the final package was a really good one. Now, that was partly because there were good pens that were drafting it for the... Um, uh, but it was a negotiated discussion. Um, the two pens were the Irish, <laughs> ambassador, the Irish ambassador to the UN and his um, Kenyan um, colleague. Um, they crafted a really good agenda for the world about leaving no one behind, and about the 17 sustainable goals to ensure that we would move towards sustainability. And the reason, I think, why 193 countries were ready to agree that was because it was voluntary, because countries could pick and choose. They didn't commit themselves specifically legally to anything. And then fast forward to December 2015, and I was even more engaged in that process as the Special Envoy of the Secretary General. And I saw that although it was a treaty, it was getting weaker and weaker as time went on. And what really made the difference was the pressure of those most affected, the small island states, the indigenous peoples, the um, poorest countries. They had a climate vulnerable forum and they exerted their voice in desperation and I remember the mantra in the street in Paris, 
1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 to stay alive. They had to get that into the text. And they got the big countries to agree. And we got a new goal, a new way of framing um, how we need to move forward. And the goal, as I'm sure you know, was to be well below two degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial standards and to work for 1.5 degrees. Now, even in Paris, and I think that was the feeling of most of us, we felt that was for the small island states. But the irony or the strange thing was the scientists had never studied this. They'd never studied the question of what's the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, and if we have to, how does the world stay at 2 degrees? Uh, sorry, at 1.5 degrees. And so that was basically what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was asked by the Paris Climate Agreement to study and to respond, which they did October last year. And what they said was there is a very big difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. And the difference is that in that span of time, bad things happen. The coral reefs will probably pretty well disappear. The Arctic ice will pretty well disappear. And the permafrost will melt more severely than it is already starting to melt. And the permafrost throws up not just carbon, but also methane, which is shorter term lasting, but much more dangerous than carbon. So not nice to know, because there's a lot of permafrost um, uh, around the Arctic and around um, uh, uh, you know, Siberia and other um, places. And if that melts, then that will be very serious. And the scientists therefore said, um, it was their you know, very strong recommendation that the whole world needed to work to stay at 1.5 degrees and not go above that, or if we went above that, capture enough carbon to come back to that, but not have a world being above 1.5 degrees. And they said it is doable if we have the political will, but what needs to be done initially is we need to reduce the um, uh, carbon emissions by 45% from 2010 standards, reduced by 45% by 2030. That was their clear recommendation. And carbon emissions went up last year. Carbon emissions will almost inevitably go up this year. Uh, China, which had been you know, coming down with its carbon emissions, they've been going up. India's been going up. The United States has decided not to take part in the Paris Agreement. So the, the, the pressure is somehow off if it wasn't for the pressure that's coming from the broad, what I would call almost a climate justice movement that's emerging. And um, it is the school children, it is young people, it is um, extinction rebellion. Um, and you know, I know in London in particular, they've been disruptive. Um, I think they need to be very careful to have the right tactics and to keep the people with them if they're going to be disruptive. There are other kinds of disruption. There's litigation. There's shareholders raising the right questions in meetings. Um, there's everyone can look at their bank. Most banks are very invested in fossil fuel. We can question our banks. I'll tell you a funny story about that maybe. Um, and um, uh, they, probably the best disruption is the investment um, moving. Um, Mark Carney of the Bank of England warning that to be too invested in fossil fuel is not wise now. You risk, you risk stranded assets. And when I first heard that expression, I, I had to ask, you know, well, what does that mean? And the person who used the phrase stranded assets said, think asbestos, too dangerous to use. Coal is pretty well a stranded asset. And oil and gas, when we can make the just transition, will become stranded assets. So to be more invested in them is not a good idea. So. Where do women figure in all this? Very disappointingly, believe me, until very recently, not in the parts of the world most affected. When I would go to meetings of African women leaders, they absolutely, it was front and center because it was so clear. Um, climate change was undermining food security, health, everything. Um, so it would be mainstream part of the discussion. But, and, and in Asia, um, more or less to the same extent. But when I would go to women's leaders meetings in Europe, or in the United States, until, until this time last year, the conversation would be about Me Too, equal pay, 
violence against women, and then it would get on to very informed conversation on health and education globally, girls getting education, access to it, health issues, etc. very informed. And then climate would be sort of mentioned without knowing how to talk about it. It was really very interesting. And what I'm very happy to say is that that has changed dramatically because that report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change last October somehow hit a spot for a lot of women leaders. 12 years, you have 12 years, the scientists said, to 2030. Now it's 11 years and we're in um, uh, late Octo mid October, late October. Um, so um, somehow the, 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 the point got across and I had been trying to communicate in different ways um, how to uh, get women in particular to uh, realize the role that women already play and that women need to take a leadership on this issue. And I began with the book um, on climate justice, which is deliberately a storybook. Um, there are 11 stories in the book. Nine of them involve women, but there are also two good men. And, um, uh, and then when the book was actually written, um, I uh, had to wait for it to be published, you know, the... Um, Bloomsbury were doing their best, but there was, a, there was a gap. And I decided I wanted to make a documentary, um, you know, just to kind of keep the pressure on, of, of, because I'm very uh, concerned about this. And uh, I was advised, no, uh, first of all, documentaries take too long. They've been done. I mean, look at um, the, um, the um, Inconvenient Truth, and, and there are lots of other very good local documentaries on the issue. And you're not necessarily the right person to make a documentary anyway. Why don't you do a podcast? And I said, what's a podcast? I mean, I'm an elder, you know. Um, and they said, well, look, leave it with us. And then they went off and came back with somebody that I might pilot with to see how it w might work. And the person that was chosen was Maeve Higgins, whom I didn't know anything about. I, I, I hadn't followed her in any way. But for those of you who might know, I think I see a few nods around the room. Um, Maeve is a very successful comedian um, in New York. She's also got a good social conscience. She's just recently made a film. And um, we did um, uh, literally about 15 minutes together, and the advisor said, that's it. This is perfect. And the perfect is that Maeve was eight years old when I was elected president of Ireland, and she's half respectful and very, <laughs> very funny. And so she's very funny, and we are very serious. And our byline in Mothers of Invention is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And usually in audiences, actually I got less of a response in this audience for whatever reason, <laughs> but usually in audiences I get quite a, sharp, a strong response from maybe half the room, but not more than half the room. And you see men looking defensively. I mean, what does she mean? And I always explain, Maeve would never bother explaining, but that's Maeve. Um, <laughs> But I feel it necessary to explain that man-made is generic. So um, uh, it, it includes men and women, it includes all of us. And um, a feminist solution definitely includes men and hopefully includes as many men as possible because the feminist solution is exactly the solution that is in the 2030 agenda. It's not branded as a feminist solution, but that's exactly what it is because it's saying we need solidarity between nations. We need to solve this problem with these 17 sustainable development goals and we must leave no one behind, which means we must be prepared to support and to um, get the clean energy to developing countries and get you know, all of the things that we're not doing enough of now. And to me, that's the solution based on equality and that is the feminist solution. So anyway, um, what I find now is I'm already a member of Fearless women, connected women, <laughs> dangerous women, um, lionesses, let me think. Uh, and all of these are individual women who've decided to start a group and do, you know, have a WhatsApp group thing. And I'm letting this um, bubble up because it's very important that it does bubble up. And then at a certain stage, I want to bubble it all together. You know? <laughs> we shouldn't be going off in different directions, but we should be um, uh, understanding the importance of it. And what I do say to audiences um, uh, is uh, basically everyone should take three steps in their life. Um, the first step is to make climate change personal in your own life. And that means doing something you weren't doing before. And I give the example that I've become a pescatarian. 
I don't eat meat anymore. I don't cheat. My husband, my poor husband Nick, has become a flexitarian. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, um, uh, and then I say the second step is to get angry and get active. Get angry with those who have more responsibility than you do in your life. You're certainly you know, using carbon, but you've decided to do something about it. You've owned the issue. Now get angry about those who should be doing far more. Governments, but also cities um, and universities. I'm glad to hear that University of, of, of Liverpool is um, uh, carbon-free. That's, um, that, that's, that's great. Um, um, and uh, business, uh, especially the fossil fuel industry, but also agribusiness, tra um, transport, etc. And then the third step is probably the most important. We have to imagine this world that we need to be hurrying towards. You know, the science has told us 12 years, it's now 11 years. We need to be hurrying actively towards this world. What kind of world will it be? Well, first of all, it will be a much healthier world because we won't have the choking pollution of um, uh, fossil fuel. I mean, I know that there are families in London who complain about um, the uh, pollution of um, cars and buses that are in, in, in London. Um, uh, it's far, far worse in many of the bigger cities, particularly in developing countries. Um, it'll be a much more equal world because if we're going to get there, we will have had to implement much more seriously the 2030 agenda. Science has made the agenda no longer <coughs> voluntary. It's actually now become imperative. And therefore, um, uh, you know, we, we need to imagine more this world. And I had a very um, enjoyable experience last November. Um, I was invited to go to the Venice Architectural Biennale. Um, for those of you who didn't know, and I didn't know before I went, to be, to be honest, um, it's every second year an art biennale and an architect, architectural biennale. And the Architectural Biennale in 2018 was curated by two Irish architect friends of mine, two women, um, Gráinne Farrell and Shelley uh, McNamara. Uh, they, they work as Grafton architects and they, do, they make lovely buildings, notably universities around the world, and they've won many, many prizes. Anyway, they were curating this um, wonderful, um, huge hall um, the, of the Biennale, and then there were um, um, pavilions for different countries that could show, you know, they could show what, what they were doing, and that, that's, that's the way it, it works. And as I walked through this great hall with Shelley and Yvonne, they had chosen the earth as their client, and they'd asked architects to respond to that. And I saw the future. I saw the circular economy. I saw not individual electric cars, but electric mobility. I saw ways of living together. I saw a project which struck me from Bangladesh of saris that had been discarded, being brought back because there were pieces of the sari which were perfectly good for high fashion. Um, I saw the ways of having no waste. I mean, it was just a wonderful sense of the world that we actually need to be talking about more and, and need to be working towards more and need to be um, thinking about a great deal more. And um, I'm going to end with a story that I like to tell and tell probably almost too much, so you may even have heard, heard it in some, um, on some wave or other, but um, it's a story that meant a lot to me. and It's about the real thing we need to have at the moment in this important moment of time where we have time to do something. We're the first generation to fully understand how serious the problem is, and we're the last generation that can do something about it, and the children can't. So, you know, that's, th that's the situation. But we actually have to have hope. And I got a great lesson in that, and I'm going to end with this and then sit down for a Q&A on whatever you wish. It doesn't have to be on climate. But um, uh, I was in New York, it must have been nine or ten years ago now, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was the first chair of the elders. Kofi Annan was the second chair, and you know, 18 months ago, whatever it was, I had took on the chair. Big shoes to fill, I have to say. But anyway, Archbishop Tutu is great fun to be with and very, very insightful, very, very good at making people laugh and relax and then coming in with his um, uh, important messaging. And we were together at a social good conference in New York, which was um, uh, involved young people who were meant to be on their 
iPhones and their iPads and create a social media buzz. We were, if, if possible, we were supposed to be trending, I, you know, all these words. <laughs> anyway, um, when Archbishop Tutu is in front of young people, he uses his arms and he kind of tells them how wonderful they are and how much he loves them and how much God loves them. And, you know, it's a kind of um, very positive messaging. And the uh, American journalist who was moderating us uh, was quite annoyed. And she turned to him and she said, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her, he shook his head, and he said, oh no, dearie, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. <laughs> and I remember at the time feeling th the strength of that. You know, when you think of his life, you know, the anti-apartheid movement, that commission that he, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I remember being in South Africa as president of Ireland and seeing him crying on television because the evidence was so overwhelmingly hard to take, hard to listen to. Um, prisoner of hope. Why? Because um, it's really important. Uh, I mean, uh, well, the glass has nothing in it at the moment because I haven't had a chance to put anything into it. <laughs> but think of it not as being a glass half full, but a glass with just a little in it. You work with that, and you make sure that you... Um, make the best of what you have and make the difference that you need to make. And the byline of the book that I wrote, and these are my heroes, that I wrote about the, the, the 11 stories, um, nine of them about women, but two good men, as I mentioned, um, they are about hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future. And every single story is about somebody who wasn't really responsible for what hit her or him, but makes it somehow becomes active in... Uh, forming a group or responding in, in a way that tackles the issue. And um, what we need to do now, the three steps that I talked about, is um, try to influence um, where um, it, it will be possible to bend that curve of emissions. And I was going to end with, with Archbishop Tutu, but I think I'll end with my friend Maeve, because I said I might come back to her. Um, Maeve didn't know anything about climate, but she had a good social conscience. And suddenly she was doing this podcast with me and we were talking and we were interviewing extraordinarily knowledgeable women about climate and we two good men again, as it happens. We've had two male mothers of invention. But um, uh, Maeve started to take this very personally. So she decided she got rid of all her plastic and she couldn't believe how much plastic she had and she'd talk about it on our next program. And then she decided to do other things. And then she said, you know, I, I, we, we did that um, uh, session on um, 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 uh, divestment, and I, I, I looked up my bank, Chase Bank. It's a terrible bank. It's terribly invested in fossil fuel. So she said, I decided to do something about it. And then you hear, because it's, um, it's a bonus point on our Mothers of Invention podcast that Maeve does on her own. So you hear her use the telephone, and ring up, and then you hear the voice at the other end. And Maeve is very nice and kindly. She's not, you know, kind of cynical or nasty in her humor. She's very, but she's very funny sometimes. And um, uh, she says, you know, I'm an, um, actually an investor in the bank. I think she had $2,000 in, in, in the bank. <laughs> said, and um, I, I'm slightly worried because I, I see that uh, the bank is very invested in fossil fuel. And the woman at the other end says, what? What, what, what are you talking about? I'm sorry. I, 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 did you want to uh, ask me something? And, and, um, and Maeve continues and says, um, well, you know, I, I really feel very strongly about this. And I think I'm going to have to withdraw my money. Can you help me with that? Oh, God knows the woman. Oh, I couldn't. No, you better get on to headquarters. So Maeve thanks her very kindly and says, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll do that. I'll take your advice. <coughs> I'll get on to headquarters. Now, I'm ringing you from New York. Where are you? And the woman says, oh, I'm in the Philippines. And Maeve says, oh, the Philippines. Oh, you have such climate problems. And of course, the woman starts, and she goes on for about 10 minutes about the terrible cyclones, the terrible problems, in her, and that you know, it's awful what's happening, and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then Maeve thanks her and said goodbye. And then you hear another um, uh, ringing tone, and she gets on to the headquarters, and it's a much shorter call because the smart woman, she's put onto the media section, I think, or something, and uh, the smart woman realizes what she's about, and after literally a minute or two, hangs up. And of course, this allows Maeve to do her 
um, uh, comedian bit. She, says, she hung up on me. I, I, I'm invested. In she hung up on me. And, you know, the, um, uh, I, I don't think Chase Bank would have been too pleased. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I'm not sure, um, uh, you know, why humor has become for me one of the great ways of communicating. Um, I, I learned that too late in life, but I pass it on to all of you who are that much younger. It is a great way to communicate a serious message. I learned it from Archbishop Tutu, of course, and, and a number of others, but I, I particularly enjoy um, Mothers of Invention with Maeve because we are very serious. We cover um, extraordinarily interesting things. I've learned a huge amount from this podcast, but the humor is the thing that I, that I really like. So now, Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Mary Robinson. I'm sure everyone will agree that was a really inspirational, enjoyable um, lecture, and thank you very much for giving it to us. Your message is obviously one of hope and one of activism, which I think is great for us to hear, and I think we'll all remember the three, your three points, which are make it personal, get angry, get active, and imagine the future. Um, I suppose we're all lawyers here, and before we open up, up to the room, I wanted to give you a chance to ask whether you think we, there's anything in particular we as a profession can do, even if we're not working directly in climate justice legal issues, whether there's anything additional that we can um, try to contribute to, to the issues given our skills and position. Okay. Well, um, let me answer you by um, saying that uh, I was invited by the International Bar Association in 2012 when they came to Dublin to the convention centre um, to give a talk at lunchtime. And, um, you know, there was a pretty sizable audience there and I had a goal. And I said, <laughs> the legal profession is way behind the curve on climate change and you need to do something about it. And I had read um, enough to know what they might do about it. I said, you need to form a presidential commission and you need to have a task force in which you really do it, etc. I had to go to Tokyo two years later and receive a very, very interesting report that they have done on um, achieving um, justice in a climate-affected world, I think it's called. It's on the IBA website. And they've had me back, believe it or not, at a, at a further meeting last year in Rome, um, as it happens, um, uh, to, to talk about the many recommendations that they had decided to have, etc. So, um, you know, the... Basically, if you think about it, um, all the structures and systems of law are based on a fossil fuel world. So, you know, where do you begin? You know, it's, it's like that. Um, what is also interesting, and I didn't talk about it, but I, there's a po one, one um, version of our podcast. Actually, the first podcast we did was on litigation with this wonderful uh, woman, Tessa Khan, who um, was part of the um, Urgenda case, the Dutch case. Um, she, she, left a good job in Bangladesh to go and work on that case because she was so impressed by it. And uh, we are seeing more and more litigation. The case in Ireland um, failed, um, and I, I understand it's, it's being appealed. Um, there, there, there are now, I think, um, cases that are going to seriously um, um, make some impact. There's interestingly, um, in the Philippines, the Human Rights Commission has decided as a commission to take on the five big um, um, fossil fuel companies that are causing a lot of the uh, problem there. And it's an interesting case because it's, it's a commission on human rights. And I've very strongly supported what they're doing. They've had a lot of problems. I mean, they've had a lot of um, strong pushback, um, both by the government there, but also by the fossil fuel lobby. Uh, but it's still going, and I, I hope it will, it will succeed. Because the first case was a case by the Inuit um, uh, peoples in Canada, uh, in the Inter-American Commission, and they failed to win, but they won, you know what I mean? Because they highlighted that um, it was hard to prove the causation. Now it's getting easier and easier to actually establish causation, because um, the science is becoming more particular, the, um, the way of monitoring what's causing this is becoming much more um, real. So, um, you know, I, 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 but um, that response of the International Bar Association uh, was, and, and Helena Kennedy and many others were, were involved in it, it was, it was telling because it is true that the, legal the law and legal profession has not adapted 
properly to climate change. Okay, well, thank you very much. And we do have time for quite a bit of questions. Anything except Brexit. <laughs> that's for, not just, that's for all of our sakes. I think we've probably had enough by now. But if you do have any questions, do raise your hand and we'll take a couple at a time. Uh, yeah, we'll start and here. If you would like to give your name. Uh, my name is David Hartstaff. I'm a solicitor here. Um, Mary, you spoke very passionately um, at the beginning there about how um, you're finding that you're always talking about climate justice now and it's, it's really the focus of, of, of your energies. Um, was there a defining moment at which you realised that you know, this was something that you were going to dedicate so much of your time and effort to? Or you know, was, there a, was there sort of an epiphany where you realised that this was as critical as an issue is, as it is? Yeah, there was in a way. Um, uh, I mean, I'm often um, you know, uh, more than prepared to say that as, as was mentioned, I mean, I went straight from being for seven years president of Ireland in September 1997, before my term had ended because of Kofi Annan put so much pressure on me. Um, I um, went to Geneva and for the next five years, so that's between 1997 and 2002, I never made a single speech on climate. There was another part of the UN dealing with climate. I was in my silo, it was a big silo, human rights, gender, rights of people with disabilities, rights of indigenous peoples, you know, they, but um, I never made the connection. It was afterwards when I formed a small organization in 2003, based in New York, but working in African countries, on the rights that really matter if you don't have them, rights to food and water, health, education, and to learn, um, you know, to sort of pioneer how a small NGO can work, not just on civil and political rights, but with a lot of experience with Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, etc., but on economic and social rights. And uh, everywhere I went in 2004, 2005, 2006, I kept hearing more or less the same sentence, things are so much worse. Um, a number of women said to me, is God punishing us? And then um, Constance O'Kellett, who's the first story in the book, who's become a very good friend um, uh, and a very powerful voice at, at conferences, um, she was, um, uh, she went to some meeting on climate and Oxfam uh, got to know her, and I was honorary president of Oxfam at the time, so um, I got to know her through Oxfam, and as she said, she learned, no, it wasn't um, God that was punishing us, it was the lives of rich people. <laughs> kind of a nice way of putting it. Um, and um, uh, what I found was, um, it was, it was actually difficult to live um, between two worlds, because I was spending a lot of time as honorary president of Pakistan, but also with, my fan, uh, my, with realizing rights, and in, in African countries, and then I was doing, you know, uh, in, um, in 2011, I went back to Somalia um, on behalf of the Irish aid agencies, etc. You know, a lot of experience of just how bad it was, and yet it wasn't affecting the very countries that were causing so much problem. It wasn't a, a, an issue really in this part of the world, and certainly not in the United States, even though there were those preparing for conferences on climate, and there was an expert world on climate. But even um, when I went to my first COP um, conference on climate, it was Copenhagen in 2009, um, and I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked that the language was so scientific and so technical. Nothing to do with people. And I realized there was no gender dimension, and there was no sense of protecting human rights. Um, uh, you know, somehow, um, that dimension uh, uh, had not become important at surfacing. And that's why I formed the Foundation on Climate Justice in 2010 um, to work with many others. But I kind of I had an inside track. I knew how the UN worked, and I knew how to press buttons. And we worked together very hard to get gender and human rights into the Paris Climate Agreement, to get the Human Rights Council to have resolutions on um, the negative impacts of climate change on human rights and to you know, have that voice coming out. And then we had country champions who helped us. So um, the foundation wound up in April um, because we, we had happily made ourselves redundant. We weren't needed for what we were, what we set ourselves up for. And the earlier organization, Realizing Rights, also made itself redundant because a lot of other organizations began to work in that space. And I don't, I don't believe it's continuing just for the sake of it. But I, I, I feel I will continue for the time that's available to me passionately on this issue because it's just so, it's an existential threat. 
and the children are right. We are not protecting their future. And I'm a grandmother, you know, so um, I don't have any choice but to continue on this one. Thank you very much. I think we had a few other questions. Yes, we'll take two together. And if you just want to say your name yeah. and where you're from. Then. <laughs> Gerald Byrne from Brown Rubik. Um, so one, one of the most worrying aspects of climate change is the fact that populist governments uh, seem to deny that it's happening. Um, have you seen any effective strategies to put pressure on the likes of Bolsonaro and maybe Trump, probably Bolsonaro most importantly, to um, pressurise them into uh, changing their views on the matter? Thank you. And the second question? Um, well, I've run a virus for three times of Ireland, and actually it was going to ask a question remarkably similar to Gerald's, but um, <laughs> anyway, it was really focusing on, uh, Mary mentioned China and India specifically, and how the, the rate, the rate um, that their um, carbon output is increasing, um, is, is, sorry, is increasing year on year, and I just wondered, Gerald obviously asked you about how you um, deal with other governments, but in particular those two governments, what, what do they say, I guess, if you can open the door for us, what do they say are the main issues that are in the way of, of them changing their ways, as it were? I've had three men. Um, <laughs> we're, we're going to have to ask the woman to reflect on a question, um, and then they'll be chosen next. All right. <laughs> um, I, I think the, sorry. The question about populist governments is a very good one, but I actually want to come back to governments, um, and I'll answer the, um, it, it's a problem that um, the populist uh, appeal is to those who feel left out. And in many cases, they're right to feel left out. You know, they're right to feel that somehow um, their interests and their <coughs> arguments were not taken sufficiently into account, um, but it's played up in a very bad way and very often distorted, um, that it's globalization that's doing it in a way that, whereas in many cases it's, um, it's uh, coal isn't competitive and it's not competitive with gas, so people lose their jobs in the Rust Belt and, the, they, and the similarly, you know, Bolsonaro is playing it up. So it's, um, the populism is uh, worrying because of what it's doing, but I think much more significant is the problem of governments generally, of democratic governments facing this issue. And I'm sympathetic to it. It's a real problem. Because governments have very short-term horizons. They are worried about the next six months, the next year, the next election. Um, no you know, elected politician is thinking more than five years ahead because I'll be gone by then probably, or anyway, you know, if I can, if I can survive till then. You know, this, is the, this is the problem. And it is a real, real problem. And um, they have to be popular enough in their, in their policies to get through to uh, be elected in the next election. And the fuel tax is a good example. I mean, uh, Macron, um, uh, in, uh, President of France, was you know, making a big reputation as a leader on climate. Um, he removed a wealth tax in France, then he slapped on a fuel tax that didn't distinguish between those in rural areas who have to drive much further, those who drive for a living, they, the whole thing, and it was so unfair. Um, as perceived, that it led to the Gilets Jaunes. A lot of the Gilets Jaunes were good on climate. But that wasn't the issue. It was the unfairness issue. And, you know, um, uh, the government in Dublin has been very conscious of increasing the, the, the fuel tax, not by much, but doing it in a way that seemed to be fair, etc. Um, uh, that's why we need the pressure of a movement at various different levels. We need the, you know, the pressure of the young people, um, women leaders, et cetera, um, bottom up, and then we need the business and investment pressure top down, pressurizing governments. And there are a lot of business leaders now who have much longer term horizons than government leaders who are desperately trying to persuade them. Um, I, I'm um, involved with a, a group of leaders called the B Team of Business Leaders, and they actually did take a leadership role before Paris they made a commitment in January 2015, so that's 11 months before Paris, to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions in their um, corporations and in their supply chains and do it the climate justice way with just transition. Just transition is not over the back of the workers, so you've got to put up a lot of money for a just transition. And, um, sorry, I, I, 
I, I'm probably giving a too long an answer to say the least because I need to get on to China and India, but just, just to answer what's happening in the European Union at the moment, the Commission. The Commission has proposed a Green New Deal. It's actually really interesting and I hope it will be passed. Um, the the um, countries of the EU have almost um, put that stake in the ground to be um, zero carbon by 2050. Four countries resisted in June, but there's pressure now, and the, you know, the, it's likely they'll do it in December. And attached is this new Green Deal. It has a proposal for a major fund for just transition, because you cannot have a just transition if you don't put a lot of money up front. And then if you put the money up front and work with the unions and work with the, um, those in coal, those in oil and gas, ultimately, then we can have a transition. If we don't do that, then it won't happen soon enough and it will happen in a disruptive way. What's happening in the United States is coal is not competing with gas and coal mines are shutting and the workers are just left forgotten. And, and the coal, coal, they're, going, they're becoming bankrupt, which is the old trick, you know, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's very bad. Anyway, China and India, um, very complicated. China is complying with its commitments under the Paris Agreement. Everybody more or less agrees that. It didn't overcommit, to say the least, but it's complying with its commitments. And um, everybody is of the view that it will be very important, if possible, that China um, increases its ambition quite significantly, which it actually can do, you know. But at the moment with the trade war, there's not much incentive. And with Trump pulling out, or saying he's pulling out, by the way, there's a nice irony there. Um, uh, it's a treaty which has its rules. So Trump can't actually pull the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement until the 4th of November, 2020. When is the next election in the United States? the 3rd of November 2020, so it's kind of a neat little point, but, um, and, and I'm sure the climate will be very much discussed, as it is at the moment with the Democrats, but India is interesting. India has gone far more into solar than anybody thought initially, and um, it has done it with a lot of um, um, help from the United States, particularly in technology, um, which was negotiated toughly by Modi before Paris, when he held out um, on the 1.5 degree um, the State Department, anything else, until he got some concessions on uh, technology on solar. But he has gone very significantly on solar, but he's also going on coal, because coal is cheap. And even Australia's <coughs> selling coal uh, to India and other um, countries in the region and to China, etc. So, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a hard one in a way, and it's, it, it's, it's always complicated, but. Um, um, <sighs> I mean, I was recently in Tokyo uh, as, a, a, as chair of the elders, trying to talk to Japan about, uh, this is actually quite funny, uh, trying to talk to Japan about getting out of coal and getting out of selling coal, coal technology to countries in the region. Um, and um, I was meeting with the three ministers in a row, the Minister of Environment, the Foreign Minister, and a Trade Minister, and every single one of them started with rugby. And I discovered that this is before Scotland. This is, <laughs> this is when they had beaten us, and we were good losers, and we celebrated with them. And I couldn't tell you how popular Ireland was. <laughs> so I was getting on famously with these ministers. We could really talk. And I discovered that the, um, uh, the young minister for the environment, who is the son of a previous um, prime minister, and he's, uh, he's the youngest cabinet minister ever, he's about 37 or 38, um, and uh, he said that he was persuaded by Jacinda Ardern at the climate summit that Japan should commit to being part of the coalition for carbon neutrality, which is basically, for developed countries, is a coalition to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, if you're a developing country, you can string it out a bit longer um, for, you know, for reasons of having energy. Um, but um, uh, so, um, he told me that, and then I met the foreign minister who began with rugby, began with Ireland, and, and then I met the trade minister who began, and I was speaking on behalf of um, the um, conference that I'd attended, which was a task force on climate, um, um, uh, transparency of climate risks, 
um, uh, and they asked me at the end to sort of speak after the Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister speaks, what does he do? He begins with rugby. So, I mean, you know. Uh, so, uh, just a phrase or two, but, you know, and, uh, sort of, and, and pointing, kind of, uh, he knew I was going to be following him. So anyway, um, uh, when I finished my uh, speech, I said, um, Prime Minister, um, you uh, began by referencing rugby. I want to respond. <laughs> I said, just like a rugby match, why can't we have a match between Ireland, which has just joined the um, Coalition on Climate Neutrality, and Japan, which has just joined the Co Coalition on Climate Neutrality, see which country will become carbon neutral first. <laughs> I'm very happy with that. Anyway, I, I, it's a long-winded way of saying, you know, it's complicated in every country. It's complicated in our country. In Ireland, we have a very um, relatively ambitious climate plan now. Implementation is going to be tough. Time for a few more questions. If anybody just wants to raise their hand, yes, at the back. Do you want to just say your name and where you're from? Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm from County Limerick. Um, and That's I'm with that, the Irish thank Post. <laughs> thank you. Um, Ms. Robinson, you've been an inspiration to countless women across Ireland. Which Irish women inspire you? Lots of Irish women um, in so many different ways. <coughs> in particular, um, the, the ones that struggle so hard on um, difficult issues, um, the uh, you know the, the health issues for women in Ireland, and you know formed groups to, to fight for them. <coughs> Sorry, cervical cancer, but lots of other earlier issues. Um, um, the two babies, you know, the, the relentless um, research done on that um, by an historian that I had the pleasure of honouring in Trinity with an honorary doctorate as, as chancellor. Um, you know, lots of women. I mean, those who, um, uh, who, who, who fought, um, you know, for uh, various rights that, w you know, we weren't able to uh, to have, and and in many ways, um, I'm I'm very proud of the Ireland of today that so many young people made a difference in campaigning for the single sex, um, for the um, same sex marriage, and then for removal of the. Uh, uh, Eighth Amendment uh, ban on, on, on abortion because I, I had opposed that when I was a senator and I actually, I remember I did a filibuster in the Senate and I actually spelt out what I saw and kind of imagining the problems that would occur and every single problem that I imagined and unfortunately more occurred and some of them were 15 year old girls etc. I mean, it was a, um, a really difficult um, situation but it, it's that uh, that, that's what I um, admire most because essentially um, I'm a human rights person who's now doing our human rights to climate justice. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, just say your name and organisation. Here it leads uh, at the chance. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on sort of the ongoing litigation um, against companies such as Shell for what they did in the United Delta. Yes. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree with it? Are we pushing them out of the conversation? Should we be bringing them in? What do you want to turn those up? Yeah, it's a very interesting conversation, and I think I'd like to answer it um, not so much in the possible, you know, the shared litigation issue, which is its own issue, I think, at this stage. Um, I had a, an insight um, recently, um, last June, when I was invited to be part of the second convening by the Vatican of the oil and gas companies at the top level, the heads of ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, Total, Olaf, they were there, and their investors. And there were a couple of scientists there. Notre Dame were the academic people doing, doing the sort of research. And um, I learned that the first convening had been a complete failure. Nothing had been agreed at all. And the Pope came, read out in Italian a very tough statement, and left with no photographs, which disappointed hugely the guys who had come because getting the photograph was all part of the, part of the intention. Um, so the second convening, 
And both convenings took place in a very interesting place. It was a casino, as they called it, a small place um, in the grounds of the Vatican where Galileo had been tried. Can you imagine that? So Galileo was tried against his science, and now we had the second convening on behalf of uh, Laudato Si, basically. Um, anyway, um, uh, it was very interesting because uh, Notre Dame had done some work in the interim, and they had prepared weak statements on um, putting a price on fossil fuel, that was one of the statements, and uh, carbon risk disclosure. So two statements, as we discussed them, they became weaker. But what was interesting to me was the tension in the room. Um, uh, I know because um, Cardinal Turkson told me afterwards that um, ExxonMobil, um, the head guy, I can't remember his name now, uh, but I can, I can see his face. Um, uh, he had his lawyers bringing him at 5 a.m. on the morning he was to agree this now very weak statement. And he said eventually to them apparently, look, I don't see anything in this statement that's going to worry me, but if I am sued, it's your job to defend me. So, you know, that's the, so there was that much tension. They signed up, all of them. The Pope came in. He made still quite a tough statement, but less tough than the previous year, and they got the photographs. Um, but uh, the point really to me was um, the, um, nothing happened. You know, it, it, was, it was just the weakness of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole thing. The Pope had convened and had the moral power to convene. Notre Dame did the academic research bit, but nobody picked up the ball of the fact that these people had signed up to carbon pricing and had signed up to climate risk disclosure, neither, none of which they're really supporting, and they're lobbying furiously against measures like that. And um, what I really concluded personally in the discussion, when you're very up close for two days with these guys, they are in no hurry at all, at all, to get out of fossil fuel. No hurry at all. And I'll tell you where they see green fields in Africa. There's a lot of oil and even coal and certainly gas being discovered in Africa. African countries wanted at Paris to do the right thing and signed up in their national term contributions to go clean energy, provided they got the investment and the technology. And guess what? They haven't got the investment and the technology. But now the oil companies and the gas and coal companies are coming into, and, and you're right that you, know, you mentioned the um, Shakespeare, the Royal Shakespeare Company, not receive, not taking BP money. Um, that actually does hurt the individuals involved. All of those things are a little bit effective, but they are able to now go into African countries that people are trying to see if we can, um, you know, combat that. But uh, what, what occurred to me is a very simple thing, but it's a very important thing to remember. The profits you make from fossil fuel are in the billions. The profits you make from clean energy are in the millions. So are you going to be in a hurry going from billions to millions? No. So I am, I'm afraid, now very much in favor of disruption. Uh, I think we need the disruption that will put us on track. And the best disruption is the one the elders are really trying to do with what I was doing in Tokyo, trying to persuade the investment community um, um, and trying to, prevent, uh, to, to persuade companies not to be invested in fossil fuel, banks not to be invested in fossil fuel. Amnesty are trying to do a big thing on banks at the moment um, and, and trying to move that needle. Because if that needle moves, that will um, help. Uh, but it's, uh, it's going to be, um, you know, it, 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 I, I realized, um, you know, I, I'm told that ExxonMobil, you often see, I mean, I've seen them in the States, advertisements of the work they're doing on algae. You know, the very incredible research. Apparently they're spending more on advertising the research than on the research, because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to be green. But actually, I know from other sources that the money that the fossil fuel industry is pouring into distorting the science, preventing companies from moving in the right direction, preventing the European Union, if they can, from going that step in December, you know, the, the lobbying, it's, it's all very proactive at the moment. And um, so we're not going to win easily, but um, uh, it, that's why we need 
the powerful movement which is emerging, and that's why we need the disruption, which um, you know, will uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know, a few of you will do what May did and bring up your bank. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, this could is fascinating and we could go on forever, but we've time for one more question and I know that this lady in the corner has had her hand up for some time. So if you could just introduce yourself and tell us what organisation you're from. Sure. Um, my name is Clara. I'm from Cork, but I also work for an American corporate. I'm a solicitor here. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what is your favourite memory of your presidency of Ireland and also what do you think was the most challenging moment of your presidency? Gosh, it's actually hard to have a favourite memory, because it was seven years when, uh, you know, it was such an honour, and, uh, you know, Nick and myself, we just, we, we went flat out, but we enjoyed those seven years immensely. Um, what was the most challenging, I suppose, um, you know, things like going to Somalia in uh, uh, 1992 was very challenging in its way, because there was a lot of press there, and I was aware that, you know, my first response when I, I you know, I picked up a child, or a woman that had to be a child, and my first response was to respond to the cameras with the child, and I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? And then I, kind of, I, I deliberately ignored, um, you know, from then on, the, the cameras and the, the press coverage, and just tried to give the, you know, the support and the, um, uh, the empathy that was all you could offer in, the, in, in that situation. Um, I made a big mistake and I admitted that, and that was to allow Kofi Annan to pressurise me to come early from the presidency. Um, uh, I had, I, I mean, the, the hardest decision I had to make actually was not to seek a second term. Um, I felt, uh, um, in many ways, that having, you know, shown that a president could do a lot more, both locally and nationally and internationally, that you know, it's time, in one way, to hand over. But I was so engaged, I didn't want to. And um, it was, you know, it was a very hard decision. I remember Nick and myself, we went to um, Malta in February. I don't recommend, it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a week to make a decision. And we came back with no decision. And we fought like cats and dogs for the part of the entire week, which we don't normally do, because he wanted me to, to, to step down and let somebody else take over. Anyway, um, that being said, it was a mistake to cut short, because it was misunderstood. And, um, I, I really regretted that because I, I, it was such a privilege, it was such an honour. And I look back on those seven years and, and we had lots of fun, we had lots of funny moments. And, um, some of them are in my memoir, but there are others that I couldn't put in the memoir. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a good place uh, to leave it with a, some suspense. I, I just <laughs> I want to say a very big thank you to you, Mary Robinson, for coming along tonight, for talking to us, to, for listening to us, and for your. Um, positive message of hope, activism, litigation, disruption, all of which we are more than able and willing to help with, and also not to go on holiday in Malta, to Malta in February. <laughs> but um, it's very hard to say thank you enough without losing dignity, but one of our members did say that she was so excited, the only person she would be more excited about was possibly Beyonce. <laughs> to the Institute, to Professor Peter Sherlow and to Dorothy for all of their help this evening and to KL Discovery who are here and who have been our kind sponsors for this event and indeed more generally. To the committee who are wonderful, there's 12 of us, they're here in the front row You can and David. Um, it's hard enough being a lawyer but they are excellent at giving their time and doing the best that they can to bring um, people together and organise events like this. So please come up and say hello, we have a mentoring programme, we have an annual dinner in March and we would love to see more of you <coughs> and thank you to all of you for coming along for joining in the discussion we would love it if you could stay with us Mary can stay for only a little bit longer but her book is available and there's also a drinks reception upstairs so we would suggest um, it's on the seventh floor I'm being told beautiful views you're welcome to the Institute <laughs> uh, so uh, well. yes so that's where the book's going to be as well uh, we suggest you bring your coats and bags and everything with you um, and, and join us in the 7th floor. But thank, please join me in giving a very warm... Yeah.